Welcome to our Build a Cell seminar series. Thank you so much, Brian, for uh, sharing your research with us here today. I'll let you introduce yourself and take it away. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Carlise. I appreciate the uh, this is a very short introduction. I know that's the norm around here. Um, I also want to thank, of course, Kate. I think she's having some trouble with travel today, but I want to thank her for her, her heroic efforts putting this seminar series together. I know it's an incredible resource for me, my students, and many, many of you all over the world, and thank her for the invitation to speak here today. So uh, my name is Brian Bellardi. I'm an assistant professor in chemical engineering at UT Austin. I established my lab in, in 2021. Let me just move some things around here on the screen. Great. So I established my lab in 2021. And uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, tell you about, give you a little bit of an update um, on our efforts to build dynamic synthetic tissue. And I'll get into that in one second. But before I do, by way of background, I thought I would describe the all the research directions that are going on in my, my laboratory. So uh, maybe starting in the top right here, we're developing new chemical probes and therapies uh, that detect and act on modified extracellular matrix in cancers of epithelial origin, more specifically adenocarcinomas. Below that, you can see we're also designing smart materials for all delivery of biologics. Um, so we're working in that area too. And then I think maybe the other one I'd like to highlight is our fundamental and longstanding interest in investigating biology and biophysics of cell contacts. But for today's talk, I thought uh, I would focus on um, some early work on living and non-living uh, synthetic tissue. And I'll get into that, uh, what that means in a, in a minute, but uh, our hope is to develop synthetic tissue into a new class of materials. So um, I think scientists and engineers and probably many of you have uh, long marveled at tissues. So tissues can adopt some pretty incredible three-dimensional uh, and convoluted morphologies. And they also have uh, really desirable and often enviable material properties. So for one, tissues are indeed elastic and deformed. And I'm just gonna show you a video here on the top left of a Drosophila embryo that's undergoing ventral furrow formation. And so what you'll see initially is that the cells within tissue are quite compact, but as a central cavity forms right here in the middle, you'll notice that these cells become highly elongated in one direction. Uh, and, you know, uh, so, so clearly tissues uh, are quite elastic um, and can deform considerably. Uh, tissues can also self-repair. So here's a video from Ann Miller's lab. And what you'll see is a variety of defects forming in a uh, tissue monolayer here, shown here on the left. And um, you'll see these defects in magenta arrows. And in rapid succession, there's cellular machinery that's recruited to these sites of repair in order to enable uh, self-repair in short periods of time. And of course, a variety of material scientists are trying to mimic or emulate this self-repair mechanisms in synthetic structures. As well as tissues can maintain anisotropic structures and movements. What you're seeing here first is an image of fluorescence micrograph of egg cells that have come together. And instead of forming the energy minimal spheroid shape, they form this more teardrop-like shape. And in doing so, it allows these cells to undergo what's called coherent movement in one direction. And the last one I wanna highlight is from a zebrafish embryo. And in the zebrafish embryo, a soluble dye has been injected into the bloodstream. And you'll see that this dye is able to move throughout the bloodstream, but because the body plane of the zebrafish has differential porosity. That dye doesn't leak out into this gray space. And this gray space is the brain of the zebrafish. So tissues um, also control porosity and there's differential porosity throughout the body plan organisms. So all these really impressive and incredible material feats that I just showed in the previous slide are a consequence of um, the mechanistic driving forces within the cells that govern tissue function behavior. So some of the tissue function and behaviors include barrier function or the ability of the cells to regulate the flux of ion salts and macromolecules across the tissue. Cells within the tissue are also able to regulate the tissue stiffness or the elastic modulus of the tissue, as well as the adhesiveness to an underlying substrate. 
And I think one function that's often neglected is cells are able to regulate material transfer between neighboring cells. And that allows for the cells to maintain a homeostasis for long periods of time. So my lab is interested in taking these tissue functions and behaviors and placing them under engineering control to give rise to a new material that we call dynamic synthetic tissue. So uh, we think of a, of, of a variety of applications for dynamic synthetic tissue. In the biomedical space, we're specifically interested in next generation graphs adhesives and filters. And you can imagine um, for the graph technology a variety of applications, but one that we're uh, more specifically interested in is developing a next generation graph material for uh, burn victims. So burn victims, of course, have a very large open wound. They need to stop the bleeding. They also need to stop pathogens from going into the bloodstream. So typically you want a graft initially that has very low permeability. Our hope then is to develop a graph material where initially you could have low permeability, but at a later time point, in a user-defined manner, you can change the permeability of the tissue on demand to allow it to match to the surrounding tissue. So that's our hope, and that'll allow the graph to incorporate better into the patient. All right, so how are we going about um, engineering synthetic tissue that would allow for dynamic changes in tissue functions and behaviors, or we're focusing on cell junctions. And so what you're seeing here on the left is a very old electron micrograph from George Pilate from 1960s, a Nobel laureate. And what you're seeing is two cells contacting one another. And what you also see is that along the lateral surface of these cells, there are a variety of cell junctions. And what's interesting about these cell junctions with an epithelial tissue is that they appear to control tissue function orthogonally or somewhat orthogonally. The apical most junction, the top junction here is called the tight junction. It's thought to control permeability. Below that is the adherence junction that controls stiffness. Further below that along the lattice surface is the gap junction that controls that material transfer that I talked about. And lastly, there's the focal adhesions that control adhesiveness of the tissue to the underlying substrate. Since each of these uh, junctions control the function somewhat orthogonally, then it might be possible to tune each of these parameters independently from one another. How do we go about doing it? Well, we would look at the molecular assembly state at each of these junctions and hopefully engineer them such that we might manipulate the molecular assembly state and in turn control these uh, macroscopic properties of tissue. Okay, so that's what I'll be talking about today, our early efforts in controlling molecular assembly of cell junctions. In the first half of the talk, I'll focus mainly on living tissue or biotic tissue and our efforts to control um, different macroscopic properties of the tissue there. In the second half of the talk, I'll transition to abiotic tissue or artificial tissue that are composed of synthetic cells. Okay, so let's just dive right in here to the first part of the talk. All right, so our work in this area was motivated by some findings we had in the, in, that we reported in 2020. And so first we were interested in um, the tight junctions, and we found that there's a key ternary complex in the tight junction. Its ternary complex is composed of a four-pass transmembrane protein known as Claudin that interacts with an adapter protein ZO1. ZO1 has this actin binding site in it, a 28 amino acid peptide that engages with F actin. We wondered if that connection between ZO1 and F actin was important for what's called barrier function of tissue or the ability of tissues to modulate permeability. So, to do this, we engineered a version of the cells that had ZO1 but just lacked that 28 amino acid sequence. And when we compared their barrier function using trans epithelial electrical resistance, we saw a drastic difference between the two. We saw that ZO1 that contained this actin binding sequence had high barrier function. That means low permeability. And if this cell line had that same protein ZO1 but lacked those 20 amino acids, we saw a drastic reduction in tear. So we followed this up and instead of um, looking at ZO1 that lacked its actin binding site, we replaced it now with different actin binding domains from a variety of different proteins. Okay, and so we picked different actin binding domains that had a range of dissociation constants or KDs. And then we took those cells and we measured their barrier function that's shown here on the y-axis. And what you see is something that's quite amazing. We see this umbrella-shaped like curve. So what it suggests, number one, is that if you engineer the actin binding domain within ZO1 with different association constants, we can build tissue with different permeabilities. 
That's pretty amazing. And then what we also went on to show was that this was a kinetic-based phenomenon. So here's the wild-type tissue. We can improve the barrier function. We can also diminish it. We can get rid of um, that actin binding within zone one completely. And then it, it, since it's kinetic-based phenomenon, it opens up the possibility that we may be able to toggle between these different states dynamically. So that was the first finding that motivated our work in this area. And the second finding is another paper from the same year where we looked at this interaction between ZO and F actin in collective cell migration of epithelial tissue. So let's look, let's focus on this top panel right here. Here are epithelial cells on the left-hand side that are encountering a wound, and they're healing that wound over the course of a few days. If we remove the ability of ZO1 and F actin to interact, then that, though, that epithelial tissue now is unable to undergo collective cell migration and close this wound. So clearly, the binding of this adapter protein to ZO1 is at, and to F actin is really important for tissue function and behavior. We thought that since a variety of these processes appear to be kinetically controlled, that that might open up the door for us to uh, manipulate the binding of ZO1 to F actin in situ, right, in the context of tissue. And if we were able to control that interaction in the context of tissue, then we might be able to tune dynamically a variety of these properties and functions. So um, I got together with my first graduate student at WeMay, and we came up with this idea, controllable actin binding switch tools, which we call casts against the actin cytoskeleton. Yeah, we're trying to have a little bit of a pun there. And I'll walk you through the design of casts. So here's the actin binding site that I just mentioned from that protein ZO1 that engages with the F actin cytoskeleton. We thought that if we placed an intramolecular binder on both the N and the C terminus of this peptide, that we might conformationally constrain the actin binding site such that it's unable to engage with the cytoskeleton. Then if we add some stimulus that interrupts this intramolecular action, then that would allow the actin binding sequence to adopt its native conformation and engage with the F actin cytoskeleton. All right, so this is our design behind CAST. At this point, we're pretty confident we've come up with three different designs that have uh, different turn on kinetics. So I'm gonna walk you through uh, these different designs now and then how they might be used in the future. All right, so the first design is a peptide-based design that are uh, that are um, from these synzip sequences or peptide sequences that are able to form coiled-coiled interactions. So we imagine we place synzip3 on the N-terminus of the peptide and synzip4 on the C-terminus, and that would, again, um, conformationally constrain the actin binding sequence such that it's not able to interact with the F-actin cytoskeleton. We could then add a different synzip peptide that outcompetes SYNZIP3 for binding to SYNZIP4. If that's the case, then there's no more intramolecular interaction, and that peptide sequence known as the actin binding site can adopt its native conformation and engage with the cytoskeleton. All right, so when we were first thinking about this possibility, we, we, we wanted to consider um, the structure of this SYNZIP3-4 coiled coiled interaction. And since it would evolve the C ter N terminal distance, we measured that distance as about seven nanometers. So we imagine about, we imagine three different scenarios. One scenario where that sequence between SYNZIP3 and 4 is not long enough to span seven nanometers. In that case, SYNZIP3 and 4 do not engage with one another, don't form that intramolecular association. And so the actin binding sequence is not constrained. You can imagine if we, add some linker amino acids, perhaps to make a very long linker, then the SYNZIP3 and 4 can interact, right? But that actin binding sequence, again, is not conformationally constrained. Only when you have this optimal linker length would SYNZIP3 and 4 be able to engage with one another, and that should in conformationally constrain the actin binding sequence. Okay, so then to predict how many linker amino acids we would probably need, we use the worm-like chain model to uh, model this linker length. And here's our seven nanometer cutoff. That's what we need to get to. And what we found is that we need about tens of amino acids, probably about 50 amino acids to allow us to span this distance between the C terminus of the sins at three and the N terminus of sins at four. Okay, so this is how we went about then designing different versions of a cast. Here's our actin binding sequence by itself, and we use the screening now in cells. So we make different constructs, SYNZIP3 followed by some linker amino acids, then the actin binding sequence, then more linker amino acids, and then SYNZIP4. All right, so um, if, if the uh, casts are not initially in the off state, then they'll look 
like they're decorating actin filaments like the actin binding sequence here. You can see if we only have 40 amino acids, then this cast is unable to go into an off state. It's still bound to the F actin cytoskeleton. If we have very long linker lengths, again, we see the same thing, right? Where these, this cast construct is still binding to F actin. But if we have amino acid linkers that are again in this optimal range that might conformationally constrain the actin binding sequence, now we see that this cast construct does not localize well to the F actin cytoskeleton. So there's inhibition of filament binding. And we've quantified that over here on the right for a variety of different um, cast constructs. We call them PEPs with different amino acid linkers. And what it looks like is we need about 60 amino acids and more. And then that tapers off as we get longer and longer. Okay, so we took our best version, which was this PEP6 version, has 60 amino acids as its linker. Again, it's initially in the off state, and we called it, we coined it basically the PEP cast because the peptide based system. Here's its activator expressed alone in cells, SYNZIP21. You can see it's completely localized to the cytoplasm. But when we express both of them, right, the initial PEP cast, and SYNZIP21 at the same time, we see a dramatic transformation where this construct goes from this inhibited state where it's in the off state, it's unable to bind to F-actin, and now it's able to bind to F-actin because its intramolecular association has been relieved. And because SYNZIP21 binds to this PEP cast, it also comes along with the ride, for the ride, right? So it's also localizing to F-actin filaments in the cell. And we see a pretty high turn on in this case, we see about 80% turn on for this, uh, this peptide based version of the cast. The other thing we wanted to see was how long does it take to activate this PEP cast in cells? So uh, we did a time course here. You can see initially the PEP cast is largely in the cytoplasm, but over the course of many hours, we see that it begins to decorate these actin filaments in the cell. Okay, so, um, and then we measured the turn on kinetics here and we get about a T1 half of 2.84 hours. So we really encouraged that we could design a cast system that goes from an off state to an on state um, within cells in the presence of the stimulus, but it's a little bit of slow turn on for a variety of the experiments we were imagining. So the next thing we developed was a small molecule based cast system that we hope would respond more quickly. So I'll walk through this one a little bit more, uh, a little bit more rapidly. But what you see here is that instead of having the synzips now, we've replaced the synzips with another intramolecular binding interaction that should conformationally constrain the ABS. Then, in the presence of a small molecule that'll inhibit this interaction, the ABS should again adopt its native conformation, bind to F actin. So here's the actin binding sequence. Again, it localizes largely to F actin filament. So we tried a variety of different arrangements of this intramolecular binder here that's from HCV. And uh, we found one where there was um, robust inhibition of filaments. Basically it's high level of off state initially. So we express that, we call it the small molecule cast or SM cast in cells. You can see it's mainly in the cytoplasm. And after we add drug, we see that that construct again goes to F actin to cells. We see a little bit less binding activation compared to the PEP cast. So we have a binding activation of about 40% um, in the presence of the small molecule stimuli. But what's really nice about this system is it turns on much more rapidly. So instead of hours long time scale, we're in tens of minutes time scales. So we have these T1 halves of turn on in about 20 minutes. So basically we can go from the off state in the cytoplasm to F actin filaments um, in tens of minutes. Uh, Uime, the graduate student, uh, thought she could do better. So we, we did one last design based on uh, light activation. So we took advantage here of the love to uh, PEP J alpha helix interaction to, uh, to build a new light based cast. So again, here's the actin bindings. Uh, sequence alone. Uh, again, it, it, it largely localizes the F actin filaments. And we found one construct where uh, the, the, uh, the candidate was almost completely in the cytoplasm. So it had uh, a large extent of inhibition of filament binding. We quantified that over here on the right. So we're getting over 90% inhibition of binding initially. So that very high off state. So here's the optocast, that's what we call this construct in cells. Uh, you can see it's completely in the cytoplasm. I'm going to play a movie for you now. Um, once I click play, basically we shine 460 nanometer light on the cells and you'll see what happens to the construct. <laughs> 
So initially it starts in the cytoplasm and over the course of now just five minutes, we go from purely cytoplasmic now to almost completely um, filament decorated. So we're really pleased by this system. Uh, we get high levels of activation, about 80%, and its turn on is, is, is very fast. So it's, we're talking about uh, T1 half of single minutes. We get about 4.4 minute T1 half for the turn on of this construct. So with these three different casts in hand, now we can imagine using them in cells uh, to modulate F actin interaction in a dynamic way um, with a user-defined stimulus. Okay, so let me show you first what I would call as a neat experiment, uh, just to highlight the power of these cast constructs. So the first thing we did with them was we took the optical-based cast and we added a dimerization domain to its end terminus, shown here. And so with this, we should we should form a dimeric version of the cast structure. Upon light irradiation, instead of binding just a single F actin filament, this construct then should start cross-linking F actin filaments in the cell. You might have heard of actin binding proteins known as bundlers. So this is basically an artificial bundler that should only start bundling in the presence of light. Okay, so here's that version, the dimeric opto-ABS expressed in a cell here. This is a hex cell. And you can see here it's in the cytoplasm. I'm gonna, add, I'm gonna click play on the video. We're adding 460 nanometer light to these cells. And what you'll see is that the F actin cytoskeleton undergoes a really dramatic transformation, right? It forms all these very bundled or crosslinked filaments in the cell. And in so doing, it also changes the area of the cell. So when you express just GFP in the cell and add 40, 60 nanometer light, there's no real change in cell area. But when we express that dimeric version of the opto switch, that opto cast right here, we see about a 20% decrease in cell area after 10 minutes. So what we can use these opto, um, what we can use these casts for are for manipulating different cell behaviors. In one case, we can manipulate uh, the cell area just by turning on the switch in a dimeric form. We also have uh, played around with this switch in tissue now. So here's a video of it um, in MDCK2 epithelial cells. And we are seeing here, it's just mainly in the cytoplasm. It's a little bit enriched on the membrane, but as we add 460 nanometer light, you'll see the cells begin to contract. And now there's these very large uh, deformations in the tissue. We can see the junctions have been almost completely um, disturbed here. And uh, just a, a massive disruption of the cell junctions between cells because the cells have all decreased their cell area at the same time, and they've added tension to the junctions. And so we see about 60, 50, 60% of cells detaching from one another when we activate this dimeric optocast in tissue. Okay, so now let me return to the idea of, of making use of these cast molecules within a native protein. So the protein that I introduced before, it was called ZO1, right? So here's ZO1 in HeLa cells. When you express it in an isolated single cell, it localizes to um, focal complexes on the periphery cell and focal adhesions within the cell body, right? So these are, these are uh, complexes that are um, at the surface between the cell and the extracellular matrix. When we remove ZO1's ability to bind to F actin, what you see is it doesn't form, it doesn't localize or co-localize with focal adhesions in the middle of the cell body. It's mainly with these focal complexes on the outer part of the cell. Okay, so we wanted to see if we might be able to switch between this dif these different states dynamically. So what we did was we we generated a version of ZO1 that removed the actin binding site. But instead of the actin binding site, we replaced it with the small molecule cast switch. Uh, and we express these in the HeLa cells. You can see here, it's largely um, enriched at the cell periphery. But what I'll do is I'll play the video and you'll note a change in its localization over time. Okay, so you probably noticed in very short period of time here, uh, we have the ZO1 that's localized mainly to the periphery of the cell, it then starts to co-localize very well with focal adhesions um, at within the cell body here. And that's because we've been able to turn on this switch within ZO1's context. The switch initially is in the off state, and then we can turn it to the on state, and then just by adding a small molecule. So we added our small molecule cells, and we see this transformation.
We wanted to see if we could use this now within the context of a living tissue. So again, we're, we're relying on a wound healing assay to, uh, to look at collective cell migration. So on the left here is just wild type ZO1 in tissues. We've deformed the tissue, we've created a wound, and we follow its repair process over time. So you can see it repairs over the course of days. Instead of ZO1, we've replaced that ZO1 with that version that I just showed you before, ZO1 that contains the small molecule cast. It'll initially be in the off state towards F-actin. So if you don't add a small molecule, what happens is this tissue is unable to repair itself in short periods of time. However, if you then incubate that same tissue with the wound with the small molecule that should turn on the CAS system, and this tissue should be able to repair itself. And indeed it does. It repairs itself um, with almost identical kinetics to the wild type so one. So what you're looking at here is wound area on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. Here's the wild type so one, it's in black. It's able to heal um, its wound in about a few days. In the absence of a, the small molecule, in the case of the ZO1 small molecule cast, we never see complete repair of that wound. However, when we add the small molecule, we see almost identical kinetics to the wild type ZO1. So what's really interesting about this is we're now able to control the ability of ZO1 to associate with F-actin now within living tissue. And by doing so, we're able to dynamically modulate the ability of this tissue to, um, to undergo collective migration. All right, so uh, that's really fascinating. So we can, we can control that tissue behavior. We also wanted to see if we could control tissue barrier function using, uh, using the same strategy. All right, so now we're looking at, now we're looking at tissue, whole tissue that's, that has no wounds. And what we've done is we've either replaced wild type ZO1 with ZO1 that has that small molecule cast that should be able to be activated in the presence of small molecules or the optical based caps, the opto cast, um, within ZO1. And again, that should be able to activate in the presence of blue light. Okay, and what we're looking at here is we're forming tissues and we're measuring trans epithelial electrical resistance. We initially measure in the absence of the stimulus and the absence of stimulus as a particular barrier function. Uh, but then in the presence of either the small molecule or 460 nanometer light, we see a change in the barrier function and an increase in tier in, these, in this preliminary data. So what this shows is that this is a really powerful way now where we can dynamically control uh, tissue properties by manipulating the in situ molecular assembly state of these proteins in living tissue. So we're really excited about this and um, we're trying to apply the same strategy at the other junctions to not only control now barrier function or adhesive niche and collective migration, but also looking at tissue stiffness and material transfer. Okay, so that concludes the first part of the talk. Um, we're now gonna shift gears and talk about synthetic tissue that's made up of synthetic cells or, or artificial cells. Okay, so uh, as I previously uh, mentioned, tissue has some really incredible uh, functions and properties associated with it. And that's often because it has a diversity of cell types and different mechanisms to communicate and coordinate its actions. What we would like to do is make synthetic tissue that's composed of synthetic cells where we can build these synthetic cells at the bottom up and control all aspects of both their composition and their function. In particular, in this part of the project, we're really interested first in trying to control communication between synthetic cells. So you can imagine we want to control the communication of the sender cell, this blue cell, to a nearby red cell or to a more distant red cell. If we're able to control communication within synthetic tissue, then we can allow the synthetic tissue to undergo uh, coordinated actions over large length scales and, and over long time scales. Okay, so we can broadly uh, categorize communication within synthetic tissue into two different categories. Um, so we can we can uh, we can start with contact based communication where a signal is passed from one synthetic cell to a next that are in contact with one another, or you can imagine a case where a synthetic cell releases a signal into the extracellular space and then it's taken up perhaps through a membrane pore into a more distant cell. 
What we would like to do is to control all aspects of this communication. So you can imagine a case where we have a signaling molecule in the extracellular space. We would want to define which cell initially takes up that signaling molecule and then how that signaling molecule is passed from one synthetic cell to another. The hope would be that this signal then would activate the cells and, for example, would allow certain cells to contract within the synthetic tissue, within the synthetic tissue, changing the three-dimensional shape of the synthetic tissue over time. All right. So uh, when I we I proposed this idea to graduate student Ahmed, he uh, he quickly narrowed down possibility and honed in on making use of connexin proteins to um, enable control over this communication within synthetic cells. So here's connexin 43. It's a four pass transmembrane protein. And normally within the membrane, it gets together uh, in six copies to form a hexameric connexon. This uh, connexon is basically a pore structure and it can either exist in one membrane to form a hemichannel structure where it can release molecules from the cell to the extracellular space or these connexons can pair up across cells to allow signals to move from one synthetic cell to another, right? So this basically encompasses all of our desired uh, capabilities um, for communication within synthetic tissue. What Ahmed thought was that it might be possible to re-engineer connexin 43, such that it's only able to assemble into this connexon structure in the presence of a stimuli. So I'll describe our work in this area now. So initially, we wanted to just see whether we could express connexin 43 in synthetic cell or artificial cells and whether it was able to assemble into a connexon pore structure. So to do this, we used inverted emulsion and we encapsulated a plasma encoding connexin 43 and the pure system that allows for transcription to the mRNA of connexin 43 and translation to connexin 43. We then hoped that this protein, because it's a multi-pass transmembrane protein, could insert into the lipid bilayer and once there, assemble into the uh, connexon structure. So here's the data now for this uh, initial experiment. We took synthetic cells and in the top synthetic cells, we've uh, encapsulated the plasma containing connexin 43 and the bottom one we do not. You can see connexin 43 localizes well um, or associates with the lipid bilayer here. Um, and we've also encapsulated dye in these synthetic cells, connexin 43. You can see in the bottom panel, this dye is just an lumen. It's unable to be released into the extracellular milieu or space. But since we've now expressed connexin 43, a pore forming protein, it's able to form pores in the membrane and release Alexa 4647 from the, um, the lumen of the synthetic cells into the extracellular space. And that's quantified over here on the right. Okay, so just using connect, so just expressing connexin 43 in, in uh, synthetic cells allows us. Um, or enables material release. But again, the whole uh, the whole effort in this area is to try to uh, engineer the ability to control this material release um, and material transfer. So the next thing that Ahmed and I did was we looked at the cryo-EM structure of connexin 43. So here's it. And if you look at it from the bottom, what you note is that that hexameric structure has the end terminus of each connexin 43 pointing into the internal space of the pore. You can also note that it's quite sterically crowded or congested within this pore. We thought this would be a great opportunity for engineering. So what we thought was if we placed some bulk on the end terminus, that this pore would not be able to assemble into the hexameric state. So what we, to, to test this, we placed M cherry on the end terminus of connexin 43. That's our bulky group here. We encoded it in the pl a plasmid and then expressed it in synthetic cells. And we compared it to connexin 43 that does not have any bulk on the end terminus. So here's the data here. Here's connexin 43 by itself. It exhibits a lot of dye leakage, but in the uh, presence of M cherry on its end terminus, we see a drop in leakage of, within these cells, meaning that this connexin 43 that has this bulky group on its end terminus uh, has trouble uh, forming or assembling into the hexameric version of its pore. All right, so uh, that's great because it gives us the opportunity to, um, to limit leakage initially and then go to a uh, higher leakage state eventually. So to do this, uh, what we did was we placed a protease domain between the N-terminal bulk and connexin 43. This protease recognition sequence would be recognized by the enzyme TEV, TEV protease. 
So we could, of course, encapsulate Tev, but it would just clip off the sequence initially. What we wanted to do was place it under user-defined control. So to do this, we encapsulated the protease Tev in a UV-sensitive liposome. And then upon shining UV light, this liposome should rupture and release the protease. At that point, then, should the protease only be able to act on the protease recognition sequence, clip off that bulky group from the end terminus and allow the connexin 43 to assemble in, into its hexameric state. And so here's the data from that experiment shown here. So um, this is that version of connexin 43 that has M cherry and the TEV recognition sequence on its end terminus. And you can see these synthetic cells also have these proteases that contain TEV, but they're not activated with UV light yet. And they have a low level of leakage from them. Then we express that same protein. We encapsulate these light-sensitive liposomes that contain the prote protease, but now we add 10 minutes of UV light to the system and we're able to turn on leakage of the synthetic cells. The reason, the way we're able to turn on leakage or release uh, within these synthetic cells is that we're able to rupture these liposomes and allow that protease to act on this version of connexin 43, liberating the N-terminal free version of connexin 43 to assemble into its pore. So we're pretty excited about this and we published it earlier this year. Now where we're going with this project is to see whether we can not only uh, control release of a signal from the um, lumen of the synthetic cell to the extracellular space, but allow this signal to transfer from one synthetic cell to another. Okay, so the first thing we did was we needed to, we needed to be able to um, <clears throat> allow synthetic cells to associate with one another and form contacts. Uh, Connexin 43 by itself was not able to accomplish this. So the next thing we tried was something right out of the biotechnology toolkit. We incorporated biotinylated lipids into these synthetic cells in both blue synthetic cells and red synthetic cells and expressed Connexin 43. We also had um, a, a dye in the blue synthetic cells, but not the red synthetic cells. Then if we add streptavid, and this should bring the synthetic cells together, they should form an interface. And hopefully if they do, then these two connexons can come together to form a full channel and allow transfer of that dye from the blue synthetic cell to the red. All right, so here's the experiment right here. We have these blue synthetic cells that are expressed in connexin 43, red synthetic cells, and only the blue contains the dye initially. In the absence of streptavid, and these synthetic cells don't form interfaces, but in the presence of streptavidin, they form interfaces. Indeed, we see evidence of signal transfer or dye transfer from the blue synthetic cells to the red. And then we've quantified that over here on the right. And I just want to highlight that this appears to be a concentration dependent phenomenon, because as we increase the streptavidin concentration, we're able to see more transfer from blue to red synthetic cells. Okay. Um, since eventually what we're trying to do is <clears throat> Uh, use synthetic tissue as a graft material within the living body, we don't want to use something like biotin streptavidin. We want to use um, uh, receptors or extracellular receptors and ligands that can also um, bind to the living tissue. So the next thing we did was instead of using biotin streptavidin, we thought we might be able to use the ectodomains from e cadherin. e cadherin is a part of the adherence junction and it's present in all epithelial tissue. Okay, so we would basically repeat the same experiment, but instead of biotin streptavidin, we would we would uh, incorporate the ectodomain from e cadherin on the surface of these synthetic cells, and they would form this homotypic trans um, interaction, driving the interface between the blue and the red synthetic cells. Um, initially, we noted the that there's a discrepancy between. Um, the intermembrane distance for E cadherin, E cadherin interactions, and those between the connexon, connexin 43 hemichannels. So um, <clears throat> from, uh, from crystal structures, we know that there's about a 37 nanometer distance difference, uh, excuse me, a 37 nanometer intermembrane distance when E cadherins interact with each other. However, when connexins interact with each other, that intermembrane distance is only about 3.5 to 4 nanometers in size. So there's this big uh, discrepancy in intermembrane distance. And of course, that'll be an energetic penalty on this system because the membrane will have to deform in order to accommodate both contacts at the same time. So we thought we would also explore shortening up this e cadherin interaction since these final one or two domains of e cadherin are important for the homotypic trans interaction. So we also explored versions of 
uh, eCAD Hiram that lacks certain domains. So here we have the EC12, but it's only the final two domains. Here's the EC15, and we also tried the EC13. So when we uh, display these different versions of the EC12 molecules on synthetic cells and measure their contact angle, we don't see any differences. And that's good because the idea is that each of these bind through the terminal one or two domains and have, should have the same um, binding energy in each case. And indeed, we, we see that reflected in the contact angle. So then we took these same constructs now and we did the dye transfer assay shown above with Connexin 43. And so I'll just direct your attention to these bars over here on the right. This is the transfer of dye from blue synthetic cell to red synthetic cell. And you can see here that we get higher levels of transfer from blue to red in the presence of each of the EC molecules. We see the highest transfer for EC12. EC13 then has less transfer and EC15 has a reduced transfer compared to EC12. And we think that's a consequence of this energetic penalty um, that comes about because of the intermembrane distance mismatch. So that's really nice. Now we can form synthetic tissue that adheres to each other and that allows um, uh, transfer from blue synthetic cells to red synthetic cells or from one, from one synthetic cell to another. So our hope, again, is not just to build synthetic cell that allows signals to be passed from one synthetic cell to another, but that we can control this process in a user-defined manner. So the last experiment that I just want to mention here um, puts everything you've heard about in the second half of the talk together. So basically, we're, we're making synthetic cells, blue and red, that both of which are um, tethered, both of which have e coherent one EC12 tether to the surface. These blue and red synthetic cells then should adhere to one another and form an interface. Instead of expressing connexin 43 now, we're expressing the version of connexin 43 that has the N-terminal bulk and the protease uh, recognition sequence. We're then also encapsulating in both blue and red synthetic cells, the light sensitive liposomes that encapsulate the TEV protease. So initially, when this version of connexins are expressed in these cells, they're not able to form the connexons, and therefore they're not able to pair with one another. Only in the presence of UV light, then, is this N-terminal bulk should it be cleaved in these synthetic cells and allow transfer of the signal from the blue synthetic cells to the red. So we did this experiment. We functionalized the outside surface of the blue and the red synthetic cells, allowing them to form the synthetic tissue. We initially looked at transfer in the absence of UV light, and we see a low level of transfer from blue to red synthetic cells. And then next, we add UV illumination just for 10 minutes, and we see a, a, a dramatic increase now in transfer. So what this shows is that we're able to form synthetic tissue now, and this synthetic tissue is able to release signals from synthetic cell to extracellular space, and that we're also able now, because we're forming these interfaces between synthetic cells, we can also uh, enable and control transfer of signals from one synthetic cell to another in a user-defined manner, in this case, um, using light. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop there uh, and acknowledge all the people. I already mentioned Uime and Ahmed throughout the um, presentation. I want to thank all the lab members um, and staff uh, within the department. I also want to highlight a uh, key collaborator in the second half of the talk, Professor Jean Stachowiak. She's here at UT Austin in BME. I believe she also gave a, a Build a Cell seminar previously. I encourage you to check it out. I also want to thank these sources for funding. Of course, uh, you for your attention. I And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, present here today. And I'll be happy to answer any questions now. Thanks so much. There are some questions in the chat. Of course, anybody feel free to unmute uh, themselves and ask. I'm gonna, I'm starting this off just because I wanna ask Azim if you're still around. Um, Azim had a question, but because we weren't answering these in real time, I'm not positive what the question is. Azim asked, how is this different from diffusion? Okay, well, um, so, of course, uh, yeah. Uh, what I think maybe what Azim is getting at is, how does this relate to diffusion? Is this an active transport process or is it a passive one? It's more passive. So connexin 43 forms a pore in the membrane and then its pore has a certain molecular weight or size cutoff to it. 
And then molecules that are diffusing in the lumen of the synthetic cells, if they are under this molecular weight cutoff, are able to diffuse through the pore and eventually uh, escape into the extracellular space. So it's not an active base transport mechanism, but we're controlling the assembly of the pore that eventually allows for the diffusion based uh, release of the molecule. So hopefully that answered the question. I can go ahead and keep reading them. So um, sure. Amber says, sorry if I missed it, are there channels expressed inside the synthetic cell or they're inserted from outside? Yeah, great, great question, Amber. It's something that we explored. Uh, we found that you can do this on uh, from either side, the inside or the outside. All the data that I showed here today was encapsulating the transcription translational machinery and the plasmids for Connexin 43 and its variants inside the synthetic cell. So for all the data, this protein is being expressed on the inside of the synthetic cell. And then... Um, under and then it undergoes a spontaneous insertion into the membrane. Awesome. Uh, Tanner says, awesome work. This reminds me of the AHL joint channels work from Hagen Bailey. Could you please comment a little on how this work is different? That's a that, that's a great uh, great question. It uh it wasn't initially inspired by um the Bailey Labs work, uh, the Bailey Labs work, but uh, but absolutely there's some really strong connections. So we were initially inspired just by gap junctions within epithelial tissue. Gap junctions express these, gap junctions incorporate these connexin proteins into them and they form these channels across epithelial tissue. But uh, a lot of our work is, is similar to what uh, they've tried with alpha hemolysin, absolutely. And they have some, some older papers on trying to engineer alpha hemolysin to form these contacts across membranes. What's nice about the connexins is you don't have to engineer that part, right? That's already uh, been evolved um, by the cells and we're taking advantage of that property. So the connexins aren't able just to form a pore like alpha hemolysin, but they're also evolved so they can form these full channels across two membranes very well and readily. And um, I think a nice also fe feature um, of this is that, uh, you know, we can, because we have the structure of it, we can now, we have the cryo-EM structure, we think that we can use rational base design to, to re-engineer them. And that's what we've shown a little bit here today. But yet it's a great point. There are a lot of parallels between the two. I do also see a hand up in the chat. Um, is it Hossein? Yeah. Um, can I ask my question? <laughs> yes. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very nice. And I really learned a lot and enjoyed. Um, I have a question regarding, it's very relevant to the first question that was asked. Um, yeah, yeah. So so these um, connections, they can um, form these um, cross membrane, like, uh, you know, this channel across two synthetic cells, but by themselves, mm -hmm. they also can facilitate, um, you know, uh, molecules passing. So my question is, um, how how do you know that you really have this cross two cell channel and not just two synthesis that are very close and the connections just facilitate this transfer? This is a tremendous uh, question, a really good point. Um, I'm gonna go back on some sli my slides here and show you something that I didn't highlight and that was my fault. But uh, what what we also include in these experiments is a heavy a hemi channel blocker because, like you said. The signal within the synthetic cell can be released either from the Hany channel or through the full channel, right? And so if no channel forms, there might just be release in the local vicinity. And because of the local high concentration of that signal or dye, it might just be taken up by the other Hemi channels nearby. And that's a great point. And it would absolutely be true to some extent. We would have to measure, of course, what that local concentration effect would be for, for full transfer. But we to these experiments, we had a high concentration of Hemi channel blocker. So we add lanthanum, which blocks hemi channels, but does not block full channels of connexins. So all the activity you're seeing is just from the full channel um, in this in these experiments that I'm showing, and that's because we've included in the experiment a hemi channel blocker at high concentrations. But without that, you're right; the data would be convoluted. It would include both full channel activity and hemi channel activity, where the signal might be released outside and then taken up by a nearby cell. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Great work. <laughs> and I think we have another question in the chat here from Brian. 
saying this is very impressive. Congratulations on getting the light system to work. How does the lipid composition and size affect the eff efficiency of transfer? Again, another very nice question, uh, Brian. Thank you for it. Uh, I, I, yeah, so the only thing we've explored is the ideal lipid composition for connexin 43 expression and uh, activity. So uh, we we, are, we profiled a variety of lipid compositions, and we found really that POPC in the inverted emulsion method of making synthetic cells appeared to be best. And we're not exactly sure why that's the case. It could have to do with the fact that you might need some unsaturated lipids to allow for insertion into the membrane. But then once in the membrane, it kind of wants a mix of unsaturated and saturated then to form that hexameric channel. We're not quite sure. We definitely need to pick this apart a little bit more. But yeah, the only lipid composition work that we've done is look at the initial expression of connexin 43 and its activity. Uh, that's for the activity of hemichannel or just release of a molecule from the inside of the synthetic cell to the outside. We have not looked at the lipid composition from transfer from one synthetic cell to get to another. You can imagine that being important too, because like I mentioned, there's going to be membrane bending that occurs, right? And so the membrane stiffness will play uh, an important role there. And so by varying the membrane composition, we might also see different um, extents of transfer from one synthetic cell to another. So I think that's a, that's a great point. We would love to vary it. We are basically optimizing two different things. One is the just the expression and insertion of these proteins and their activity. And the other thing, yeah, is um, whether it will affect uh, you know, release or transfer. Yeah, very good point. Thank you. Uh, that's so far it for questions in the chat. I will, again, will last call for questions. If you want to write them in the chat or unmute yourselves and ask them, go for it. But in the meantime, while we're waiting for maybe people to write any last minute thoughts, thank you so much, Brian. That was incredible. Your work is awesome. Uh, and I'm really excited to see more. Yeah. And thank you everybody else for attending. <laughs> Yeah, wonderful. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it, especially I know schedules are starting to get congested with the start of classes in the U.S. So thank you all. I appreciate it. All righty. Right. Have a great rest of your week, everyone. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you.